My name is Heather Lowe, and I am Legal Counsel and Director of Government Affairs at Global Financial Integrity. Thank you very much for coming out to the Open Gov Hub this morning. This is a fantastic new space, and, uh, and we're really pleased to, to have the opportunity to be here and to, uh, and to present this really important topic, the topic of anonymous companies and how they're created around the world. Uh, specifically, we're here to talk about a new book called Global Shell Games, which was uh, based on exhaustive field research by Dan Nielsen, Mike Findley, and Jason Sherman, looking at the ease of setting up anonymous shell companies around the world. Now, an anonymous shell company, or an anonymous company, it doesn't necessarily have to be a shell, uh, is a company for which no information is collected about the people who, who essentially own, control, or really benefit from the function of that company and the existence of that company. At Global Financial Integrity, we've been working on this for a very long time. Um, we've really been trying to raise awareness of the role of anonymous shell companies in the uh, opaque financial system that moves some $1 trillion in illicit financial flows from developing countries every year. We've really been harping on the role of the US, the UK, and other OECD countries as the facilitators of these outflows and the locations where actually a lot of this money ends up. As a result, I think the book does slightly incorrectly suggest that GFI focuses our criticism um, and policy recommendations on the sort of island nation tax havens uh, that are so prominent in public perception. This GFI is very strong belief, actually, that the majority of the facilitation and absorption of illicit financial flows from developing countries is actually from the developed countries, the OECD, G20 type countries. That's supported by our research. In 2010, we released uh, an absorption report which estimated that between 56 and 76 percent of illicit financial flows from developing countries are actually absorbed by developed country banks. That means that less than half or down to about possibly a quarter of those illicit financial flows are actually ending up in tax havens, or what you traditionally think of as tax havens. Um, our U.S. government context can certainly attest to the years of work that we've put into uh, addressing this problem, the problem of creation of anonymous shell companies in the U.S work that I am very pleased is supported by the research um, in Global Shell Games. But let's get to the meat of today's event. Um, we'll be hearing from the authors themselves in a minute, who will explain their novel way of, uh, their novel approach to international relations research, which is a little bit different, uh, and discuss the findings of their global research on anonymous companies. The first speaker today will be Dan Nielsen. Dan is Chief Social Scientist of the AID Data Center for Development Policy at the College of William and Mary, as well as being Director of the Political, uh, Political and Economic Development Labs and Associate Professor of Political Science at Brigham Young University. Dan's research uses randomized control trials and extensive field experimentation to study foreign aid, international development, government corruption, and international law. Following Dan will be Mike Finley a political scientist at the University of Texas at Austin. Mike's research and teaching address development, terrorism, and civil wars, and his research methods also include field experiments, as well as statistical and computational models and interviews. Mike is currently conducting ongoing field work in Uganda, South Africa, and Malawi, and also works extensively with the international development organizations. In particular, his work on geocoding foreign aid has been adopted by or developed with the World Bank, USAID, the African Development Bank, the International Aid Transparency Initiative, and many aid recipient countries. Finally, we will hear from our good friend, one of our good friends and resident experts on anonymous companies and the international movement of tax evading and other criminal money, Jack Blum. Jack is an attorney as well as chairman of Tax Justice Network USA. Jack's legal practice focuses on areas of bank and securities, securities firm compliance, congressional investigations, international financial crime, money laundering, and offshore tax evasion, where he works and also teaches globally, and on which he has actually testified numerous times in Congress. Jack has also served for many years as a United States Senate staff attorney, where he was involved in a number of well-known investigations, including the investigation of Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or BCCI, as most of you may know it, uh, General Noriega's drug trafficking and Lockheed's overseas bribes. That's really where he cut his teeth on those types of investigations. Um, all of our speakers today have 
published widely, and we've provided you with more details of their work and their publishing in the biography that we have made available. So please do uh, jot down any questions that you have, be thinking through this stuff, think critically um, during the presentations, and hopefully we can have a really lively Q&A session at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Dan. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and um, really uh, great thanks to Heather Lowe and E.J. Fagan and the others at Global Financial Integrity for actually putting on this event. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's an honor, and um, and it's a very important topic, as you know, which brought you all out. So uh, we're we're happy to work on it. Uh, just to acknowledge our, our uh, co-author Jason Charman, uh, who really is um, uh, the uh, the issue area expert. Uh, my work focuses on government corruption uh, and, and sort of center of gravity. Mike's, Mike's work is on political violence, especially terrorism. So you can see the convergence of, of interests here. Uh, but but, uh, but Jason has been working on uh, on uh, uh, financial crime and uh, uh, international uh, you know financial uh, issues for quite a while. So uh, okay, let's let's uh, let's get into this. This is uh, this is Lu Zhang. Um, she. Uh, uh, it turns out that she was a, uh, uh, her, 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 her main job for a long time was working at Burger King. Um, uh, it turns out she, she also was a notorious financial criminal, uh, which was unbeknownst to her. Uh, so for, you know, a few dollars per page, she would sign whatever documents uh, the, the folks at an incorporation service put in front of her. Uh, and, uh, and, and she was surprised to learn that she had uh, masterminded a, uh, a, 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 an arms uh, sanction, or arm busting sanctions uh, 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 transfer of arms from, from uh, Iran, or from North Korea to, to Iran, and uh, two of the three axes of evil in one shot. So uh, this is a house in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, and uh, and um, from floor to ceiling, Right, and this is uh, this was reported uh, uh, very uh, extensively uh, by Thomson Reuters. Um, from floor, floor to ceiling, there are two thousand mailboxes in this house, in the, in the main in the main room of the house, uh, and uh, and each one houses uh, an anonymous shell company, um, including uh, a company owned by Pablo Lazarenko, uh, which uh, Transparency International has named the eighth most corrupt politician of all time. Uh, so, um, uh, more on him in a minute. So, so. Uh, uh, so, um, among other things, uh, including Pablo Lazarenko's real estate assets, uh, the uh, Wyoming Corporate Services Incorporated uh, has, has companies that have sold, uh, sold you know, bogus parts to, uh, to the Pentagon, uh, illegal internet poker, um, subprime credit cards that are you know, illegal, uh, and of course, uh, many other things that um, are notorious and uh, generally see as bad. So, um, uh, here is one of the responses we got uh, to our study. So, uh, and I'll, I'll explain more about that in detail in a moment. Uh, but um, uh, we we, had, we approached thousands of corporations around the world, uh, corporate service providers around the world, and asked them uh, for shell companies. This is one of the responses. This came from a Canadian company in response to an alias we used for, uh, that, that we claimed was from New Guinea. Um, it sounds like you want to form your company anonymously with the state. Is that correct? We can do that for an extra twenty-five dollars. Uh, if you're just setting up a corporation, that, and that's it, we don't require any documents from you at all. This is not how it's supposed to work. Uh, this is how it's supposed to work. Uh, whenever, and, and of course many of you are, are, are deeply familiar with this, uh, with this area, um, whenever you incorporate international standards, inter international recommendations, that, that nearly every country in the world has signed on to, require that you, that you produce notarized photo identification, uh, usually a, a photocopy of the, uh, from, your, uh, from your passport picture page, uh, and proof of address, right? And so, uh, and, and these global standards require that, that all corporate service providers working in the signatory countries ask for these uh, documents when they incorporate from the beneficial owner, the person who actually uh, is in control of the company. Um, but of course, uh, we worried that this was not universally followed, uh, as, the, as the example from Canada illustrates. Um, Okay. Let me just uh, tell you tell you what we what we did basically. Uh, uh, we um, this is 
So a, a lot of uh, people have talked about this in, in, in sort of the policy world. They talked about it as a secret shopping operation, uh, which in some, to some degree it was. Uh, it was an important you know, sort of part of what we were doing. Uh, it was also something that in uh, social science we call a field experiment. Uh, in a field experiment, you randomly assign uh, different conditions, in this case different information, uh, to different corporate service providers to learn if, if that information causes them to behave differently. And because of the random assignment, everything else that might be different um, and that might cause a change in the level of compliance is held constant. Right? It's all balanced, uh, except for that key information difference. And so if there's a difference in the outcome, you know, you can be very confident anyway, that it, that it can be attributable to that, to that information and not to anything else. So that's, that's the advantage of a, of, of a, uh, of a randomized uh, control trial, which is what we specialize in. So uh, in this way, we can get a causal effect, uh, not just uh, correlations, which is, which is sort of typically what we would do, do in some time. Okay, so give you a sense of, first we ha had to get institutional review board clearance for this, uh, the human subjects uh, uh, ethics board, uh, universities. Um, I'm looking around the room, a few, of, a few of our former research assistants are actually here, I'm not gonna point them out to you. Uh, but, but uh, um, and so this, I mean, you know, they, they really uh, did, the, did the bulk of the work here. Uh, and, uh, um, and so we generated aliases, we used deception, uh, and uh, we just couldn't figure out a way to do this without, you know, without deception. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, we made a case that, that sometimes when, the, you know, when the, the harm that's caused by you know, a global activity uh, is big enough that it might overcome the, the, the clear wrong that's, that's caused by lying, right? So, uh, but in, in this case, uh, uh, we, we, we found that the, you know, that the uh, costs uh, of that were, were outweighed by the benefits. So um, we sent uh, a, just under 4,000 emails to uh, corporate service providers in, in uh, more than 180 countries. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we randomly varied the information we gave them to learn if any, any information we gave them would make it harder or easier to obtain an anonymous shell. Um, when the, uh, the companies responded to our emails, uh, there were several different responses that they could, uh, they could provide. Um, they could not respond at all, I should say, they, they didn't have to respond. Uh, and that was about half of them, just under half, uh, didn't respond at all. Um, and uh, they, could, um, they could just refuse service altogether, which, which significant share did. Uh, they, could, they could demand notarized photo ID, um, which another significant share did. They could ask for some ID, but not require that it be notarized or certified or apostilled in any way. Um, uh, or they could just say, Olay, right? Uh, and, and, and say whatever you want, right? Um, and, and many did that. And I'll show you, I'll show, you know, later we'll show you uh, uh, what, the, what, the, what that looked like. Um, so, uh, okay, so, um, some people that have, that have questions about the study have worried that, uh, that once, once we actually got an answer about what documents were required, we said, thank you, our, our business needs have been met. Right? Uh, implying it was met elsewhere, but we just we, we, we learned what we wanted to learn, we were done. Um, and, um, and some wondered that maybe, maybe these corporate service providers would, at, at the first node, say, uh, no, we don't require any documents, but then later in the line say, now we require you know, notarized photo ID. Um, and that's a good question. Uh, it turns out that, that Jason, uh, our, our co-author, has actually gone all the way to the end and purchased some uh, shell companies uh, and, with, and with 50 more, he has done everything but, uh, but wire transfer those. So we're pretty confident that what they say, and, and, and not in a single instance, uh, and not one instance, did, did someone switch. Right? So corporate service providers have, a, have, have strong incentives uh, to, to, be, to be forthright and transparent up front about what they require. Uh, and we, never, we haven't seen any switching going on. So, um, so the, 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 the evidence we show you here, we're pretty confident, actually reflects what would actually happen if we'd gone all the way to the end of the line and purchased corporations. Okay. Um, uh, we call these subject pools in social science, but this was the, this was the set of, of targets that we, that we, were, uh, we were after. Uh, just under 4,000 of these firms, we, we, uh, we approached them all twice, uh, at least twice, and in a few cases, uh, three times. Um, the majority were in, uh, were, were around the world, uh, and, then a, and then a significant minority were in the United States. Uh, so we could, we could get a really good sense of both cross-national variation and, uh, 
uh, and uh, variation within the United States. Uh, we did we did some social science things to make sure that we were that, that we had pretty good pretty a balance uh, um, you know across the different types of countries and types of states, <clears throat> and then we randomly assigned uh, these these, uh, these conditions. And here they are. Just really go through them um, uh, pretty quickly. We had to have a baseline, something to compare against. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, you know, in, in social science parlance, uh, and, and, uh, in, 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 ma in medical science, it's called the placebo. Um, and our placebo was what we called North Australia. Um, uh, the, the inventor of this, of this term is in the audience. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and it was the four Nordic countries, so, so uh, that, that service providers in this condition saw uh, an email from one of eight aliases originating from one of, one of eight countries, the four Nordics, uh, and then four other, um, you know, sort of minor power, uh, you know, uh, very low corruption, wealthy, developing, uh, developed countries, uh, and uh, Netherlands, um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Austria. Uh, and we call this Australia. So, uh, and and all of the uh, all of the approaches ask for the same thing. They ask for as you know, they ask for incorporation as confidential as possible, uh, and and for reasons of tax liability and. Uh, um, or, or, or tax, tax payments and, li and legal liability. Um, and then they ask, what, what, what documents do you need? Um, we, we wondered if just telling the, the corp corporate service providers about international law, if that would make a difference for them. So maybe they just didn't know. Uh, a survey that we'll talk about, uh, that Mike will talk about uh, later, we actually followed up with them uh, and, and asked them, were they aware of the Financial Action uh, tra Task Force standards? Uh, and 70% um, uh, and, and said no. So for a large share of these corporate service providers, they did not know there was international law governing this. They were fully aware of any domestic law that covered it, but they were not aware of international law. So we, we, we just made them aware. So for about 70% of, this, this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the firms, roughly, if the, if the survey can be believed, they didn't. They weren't. Um, they weren't informed, and so we informed them. Uh, and and we wanted to know just if telling them about the law if that would make a difference. But then it's a double-edged request because then we, then we come on to say, but we really would like to make this as confidential as possible. So it might be a little wink, wink, nod, nod. Right. Um, so uh, uh, the question is, it, you know, is this is this real? Is this information, or is it just you know, is it is it just something I already knew? And our point would be, if they already knew it, then we're bringing it to the foreground of their minds. Um, uh, psychologists call this a prime, right? And so it should have the same effect. Law should matter whether or not they didn't know about it and they were informed for the first time or whether or not they knew about it and now, and now, now we've made it in the foreground. Okay, so that was the idea behind it. Consistent um, uh, ideas there. So um, We also offered a bribe. We said, uh, um, I'm willing to pay a premium uh, to uh, one of the most uh, famous scholars of international relations suggested this to it. Uh, and, uh, um, and he, I think he's tickled by it, you know, that he came up with this, uh, this bribery condition. So, um, uh, we also told them, at least for the, for, for the service prize in the United States, we said um, that this realm is governed by the Inter Internal Revenue Service, right, and they enforce it, um, which is what they say on their website. Uh, of course, we know that this is really governed by states, and that the federal government has, has little to do with this, this domain. But that's what the, the IRS says uh, in, 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 uh, in reporting its connections with the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, so we thought we could do this without deception. Um, uh, just a little story uh, to, 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 to introduce the next uh, condition. Um, some of you are familiar with this. Uh, uh, Kenya wanted to change its passport system, and so they tendered bids for uh, for you know for a contract to do that. Um, a French company bid six million uh, euros. Uh, uh, a UK firm bid thirty million euros uh, and won the bid. Now. I'm not a you know I'm not really good at math sometimes, but that suggests that that's not the way it's supposed to work, right? Uh, the the company uh, named a Anglo Leasing uh, turned around and, and, and contacted with the French company for the six for the six billion euros and pocketed the rest. Uh, but uh, but the investigation had to stop uh, at a post office box in Liverpool because it was shell. So uh, this brings up the corruption uh, treatment. We call this Guinea Stan. Uh, and, uh, so, so the aliases has come from one of eight countries uh, that have very little in common except, or at least across the guineas and the stands, have very little in common except that they're all among the, the, the 20 most corrupt countries uh, on the planet according to Transparency International. And in these uh, emails we said, 
we work in government procurement. The atheist said, I work in government procurement, right, which is the most corrupt sector. Uh, so this was a very strong signal that, that, that this was involved in corruption. Um, you can see that you see the eight countries. Um, uh, to introduce the next treatment, um, you know, terrorism is a little bit um, interesting here because terrorism doesn't cost that much for the most part. Uh, but, but they still have, and, and sometimes it's the opposite of money laundering. They're taking good money and actually moving it into terrorism. But, but anonymous shell companies are very useful for that purpose. Uh, and and, one of, and, and, and allegedly, one of those was involved in, in funneling money to, a, to a, uh, an important Al-Qaeda uh, uh, operative um, from a set of, uh, of shady uh, shell companies in, in my home state of Utah. Um, so here's the terrorism treatment, right? Um, in this, in, this, uh, in this treatment, we said that the, the alias was moved from one of four countries uh, that have been uh, associated with, uh, with uh, suicide terrorism. Uh, and, uh, and then we said, uh, we, I work in Saudi Arabia for Islamic charities. We tried to raise every red flag we could for terrorism. Uh, and, some, some, and, some, and some actually picked up on this, right? Um, but, my, my, but some were still perhaps willing to give us an anonymous shell, but we'll talk about that in a minute, too. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to give it to Mike now and let him talk about the results. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about three different sets of results. Um, one, uh, first talk through the country by country league table, uh, the state, uh, the United States state league table, okay, just looking at basic overall compliance rates. Um, and then introduce uh, something we in, in the book refer to as a dodgy shopping count. Uh, which I'll explain in a moment, and then I'll walk through some of the statistical results, but in brief, just to sort of uh, let you know what we did there. So uh, on the country by country table, let me first say before putting it up, um, you know, this, again, this is not a measure of compliance that's somehow at the national level. This is a measure of compliance that's based on reaching out to these corporate service providers, observing how they react, right, and then taking all of their different responses within a given country or within a given U.S. state and aggregating them, right? So when we say the U.S. has a compliance rate of X percent, right, what that means is uh, for all the service providers in the U.S., if you add up their compliance rates, right, you're going to get some percentage of that that's compliant or non-compliant. So here's the basic table, or uh, the, the basic figure, which is, which is also in the book. It's, it's tough to see, so let me just talk through a little bit of it here, and I'm thinking the, the laser's not working there. So at the top, we've got uh, Cayman Islands, uh, Jersey. Uh, a few others. I, I guess the other thing to note very quickly is we only included in this uh, in this league table uh, countries that received at least 15 or more approaches from us, right? So we actually, uh, in total, reached out to about 181 countries. This represents a, a, a smaller set of this, right? But these were the countries that got the most uh, outreach on our part here. So Cayman Islands, Jersey at the top, Isle of Man, uh, Libya, um, strangely enough, uh, British Virgin Islands, and some others. Uh, just to, uh, you know, again, this is in the book, and uh, you can sort of look at it elsewhere. But let me point out, you know, some interesting things about where the U.S. is. We actually broke out the U.S. into three different categories. Um, uh, so we have uh, U.S. law firms, uh, U.S. Uh, corporate service providers, and then an, an overall account. So just to give you a sense of where they are here, um, here's USA law firms. Right? And again, this is the, the proportion compliant, right? So if you have a compliance rate of one, right, you're fully compliant. So USA law firms are coming in at about 60% compliant, okay? Uh, so of those that respond to 60% compliant, USA overall, about right here, zero, uh, about 30% compliant. So again, I'm be a mathematician. You do the math and you figure out where the corporate service providers are, okay? These are these independent companies, dead last. Okay, so um, down here at, uh, at about 10% compliant. And this is just of those that responded. Um, so uh, it certainly doesn't look good for uh, countries like the United States in here, uh, which pushes us to the next step of let's actually look at which states within the United States um, are the best and which ones are the worst. So this one's probably a little bit easier to see here. Um, again, compliance, uh, this is compliance rate, so a one, 100% compliant, zero, uh, zero percent compliant. Uh, the usual suspects come in uh, right here at the bottom, Delaware, Wyoming, and Nevada. Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming. Okay. Uh, a few additions at the bottom of the pack here are Montana, uh, Alabama, Missouri, uh, and so forth. 
So, um, you know, while at least there's a lot of suspicion that the, the, you know, the tax havens are where, uh, you know, most of the action is occurring, uh, it turns out that the U.S. Uh, and specific states within the U.S. Um, are probably the worst offenders here. This, um, this also just raises, uh, from a kind of a scientific perspective, too, uh, what we can sort of glean from this. And in some ways, you see, uh, you know, there's some suspicions about places like Delaware, Wyoming, and Nevada. And we actually found that they were highly compliant. We might start to question whether the, you know, whether the study was really, uh, you know, on track, right? But the fact that we were able to find some of these usual suspects and and, and measure them, and, and they came in where we might expect within the United States, suggests a lot of uh, at least sort of face validity uh, to to the results here. Okay, so that's compliance. Again, this was based on the one outcome of compliance, whether they actually requested the uh, proof of identity or uh, notarized ID and proof of residence. Um, one of the other outcomes that Dan brought up was uh, uh, non-compliance, right? The way he put it, these are the ones that say, olay, right, do whatever you want. Um, we can take that measure and we can turn it into what we call a dodgy shopping count. And the idea behind a dodgy shopping count is we just wanted to figure out if you were to you know, wake up one morning and think, hey, I'm going to go get an anonymous shell company today. Uh, I'm going to do a little looking around, right? I'm going to start at the top of the list and I'm just going to go down the list until I get one, right? How many do I actually have to go through? That's the, that's the idea behind the dodgy shopping count, okay? Um, it's derived from the non-compliance rate, so it ends up being mathematically just one over the non-compliance rate. So in this case, 5% uh, uh, non-compliance, one over 0 0.05, would indicate you'd actually have to go through, you'd have to go 20 firms uh, or 20, 20 corporate service providers down the list before you, uh, before you got your uh, anonymous shell. Okay. So we calculated this for um, both at the uh, kind of at the, at the country level and grouped them into country groupings as well as by the, the treatments, uh, the experimental treatments, which uh, which Dan brought up. So um, so here's what we find when we organize it by country groups. Okay, so the, uh, for the OECD countries, okay, uh, easiest place, right? You would actually have to go through about 7.8 uh, approaches okay, before you would get an anonymous shell. Okay. And just to give you a sense here, um, you know, and a few of our former RAs were, 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 are in the room here, right? They can attest to this. Uh, if you get your list, right, and you start reaching out, it doesn't take that long to go to make eight approaches, right? I mean, it's, I don't know, an hour, something like that, maybe a little over an hour to, to, to put out your eight approaches and then you've got yourself. Uh, on the tax havens, you'd have to go through about 25 different, uh, 25 approaches before uh, you're able to uh, get an anonymous shell. So uh, the hardest places are, would be the tax havens and then the developing countries um, in between those two, uh, coming in at, at 12 approaches. Okay? To do this by experimental treatment now, uh, which we randomized, um, we can see, uh, so for, for international, uh, we're just, just reporting a few of them here. The placebo, this is the one Dan mentioned before, where um, you know, there, we don't signal a lot of new information, we just request an anonymous shell. Um, in these ones, you'd have to you'd have to make 11.5 approaches okay, before you uh, before you successfully uh, obtained your anonymous shell. Uh, the FATF, this was in, again informing them of um, of the international standards here, right? No different, okay. In fact, maybe just slightly better, although those you know, sort of meaningful difference in a statistical sense. Um, so uh, bringing up international law uh, just doesn't seem to have an effect. And uh, you know, ironically, when we were putting this together, we uh, we decided to to include this treatment, and we would tell people about it, and, and people would laugh at us, and they'd say, "Oh, you're going to tell them it's against the law, uh, or against international standards," and 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 then see what they say. They're all going to be compliant, every last one of them. They're not stupid, right? And it turns out, we don't find any big difference here. Okay, uh, the premium. This is the the kind of what Dan described as the bribery uh, treatment here, right? Just saying we'd pay an extra premium. Um, so 16 uh, approaches, so a, a rather large increase here. Uh, almost, uh, so in statistical parlance, right, we'd say it's statistically significant, sort of trying to say that there's a real meaningful difference between the premium and the placebo here. It's very, very close to being some, a, a meaningful difference in a statistical sense. Corruption, not much different, and then the terrorism one, which we bolded here to, to say that this is uh, a statistically significant difference or a large enough meaningful difference from the placebo. Okay. Um, to look at this in the United States, uh, we see something fairly similar for placebo, uh, FATF, and corruption. No meaningful changes there. Um, but for the IRS and the terrorism treatments, 
uh, we see uh, meaningful increases here. So in other words, giving them information about the IRS and about the uh, potential enforcement from the IRS makes it harder to get your anonymous shell. You'd have to go through 13 approaches rather than just nine approaches uh, in order to, to get it. And then again, terrorism uh, very high as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend, we've, we've got a, a few different um, uh, uh, graphs like this that sort of go through all possible results. I'm not gonna go through all these, but let me just uh, give you a bit here um, just, to, just to show you kind of what shows up in the book here. We, you know, in the book, I think it's very, uh, we, try, we spend a lot of time discussing the more intuitive measures like dodgy shopping count and other things. But these graphs here contain kind of the overall picture of what's in the results here. And basically what they show is, if you look at the, the upper pane here, it's telling you the proportion that fall into each of the categories. So the, the upper left, proportion non-compliant. Okay, so among the, in, in the international sample, proportion non-compliant. So for the OECD countries, um, uh, we end up with like, what's that, about 13% um, non-compliant uh, tax havens, uh, much lower, maybe three or 4% non-compliant uh, developing countries, what about eight or 9% non-compliant, right? So, so these are the proportions. So what you can begin to do is compare. So if what we're really worried about is non-compliance, right? Then we can look at this and say that OECD have higher, higher proportion of non-compliant providers, right? So a higher proportion of service providers that are willing to say, you can do what you want, right? We'll set you up. You don't need to, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't have to uh, go through any of the requirements here. Uh, this begins to shift as you move up. So you go to part compliant, right? So this is actually a better outcome. They're at least requesting something, okay? And then we see the relationship flip between uh, OECD, uh, OECD and tax havens. Now, there's, the tax havens are more partially compliant okay, than, the, than the OECD. And then you go to the compliant and you actually see the tax havens really jump up uh, much higher, right? And so... So looking at the ones that actually say, we need this, we need this, we're gonna be compliant, right? The tax havens have a much higher proportion here. The, the bottom pane is just uh, showing statistical differences. And so um, I'll walk over here real quick. So what this is showing here is for, for the tax havens, this is showing the difference between the tax haven and the OECD. So if you look at this difference here, right, we can say, uh, we compute a statistical difference here, right? And then these little bars say, can you be confident in the result? And if the bars cross this line of zero, you can't be confident, okay? But if they don't cross zero, you can be pretty confident that that's a meaningful difference um, that, that, that would not just occur by random chance, right? So we can see that this tax haven, the, the, the lower proportion of non-compliant uh, providers and tax havens is indeed a meaningful difference, right? So if we look at this and say, ah, you know, whatever, this is not, you know, that's not all that meaningful, well, I may not be right, but this is statistically, if we use the tools of statistics, it shows that the tax statements are meaningfully different. The developing countries are meaningfully different from the OECD. We can see this on the partial compliance. Tax statements are more partially compliant than OECD, and that's a meaningful difference. We see another meaningful difference there. Okay? So that's the basic intuition behind these graphs. Again, I'm not going to go through them all, but just to, um, you know, sort of some trust me slides, so to speak, that we actually tried to go beyond just uh, simple bar graphs, right? I mean, there's some statistical tests underlying uh, underlying what we've done here, okay? Um, so I won't point out much on these. Let me just say briefly, um, one of them that we didn't uh, sort of raise earlier was a, 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 an intervention where rather than bring up uh, public standards, public international standards, we raised uh, private standards from the ACAMS body, which is this private standard setter um, that, um, you know, that, that, that does some things fairly similar to what the FATF would do but from a private perspective. And you know, notably, uh, again, if you see on these on the statistical differences here, remember I said if the, these lines crossed over zero, then there was no meaningful difference, right? And if you look across the board here, in pretty much every case except one, there's no meaningful difference here, okay? So bringing up public and private standards doesn't change things, okay, uh, in relation to the placebo condition, okay, which is, again, uh, a, a pretty worrisome. Okay, um, I'm going to move forward in the interest of time. Um, so let me just bring up one, one final uh, set of uh, uh, analyses we did. Dan brought up this survey very briefly. Let me give just a bit of context here. Um, you know, when we started this, the, the social scientists in the room were pretty, uh, were, were pretty queasy about what we were doing, a little worried, you know. Okay, you're setting up aliases, right? You're proposing 
violating some you know pretty important international standards potentially right you're doing lots of things to conceal your identity uh is this maybe all legitimate right why not do something else right and, and so for political scientists the standard would be uh, do a survey or do a survey experiment and you know it doesn't just have to be blindly asking someone hey would you break you know international or violate international standards you could use different techniques potentially right to try to you know tease things out but in general the, for the proposal was why not just do something like a survey or, or do some other investigation um, and then about midstream, in this, and, and we would respond and say, well, you know, if we just ask them, they're going to lie, right? Anyway, about midstream in the experiment, it actually dawned on us that we could do a survey, right? When the experiment was completed, let's just do a survey at the tail end of that and actually see what they would say, okay? So they didn't know that they were part of the field experiment. So when they got the survey at the very end, they thought this was their first, you know, their, their first interaction with some researchers. And then the clever part of this, what we did is we, we took the inter information that they had in the field experiment where they didn't know they were being studied. So if they had the terrorism intervention in the field experiment, um, we piped that into the survey and we gave them the same basic context. We changed the wording and stuff so you couldn't match these things up. But we basically gave them the same information in the survey context that they had in the field context so we could compare apples to apples here, right? Um, so when we do this, um, for those responding, here are the, here are the basic uh, here are the basic results. So um, the blue shows the uh, the let's see the proportion I guess yes the, the proportion compliant a non-compliant in the field experiment. Uh, when we ask them in a survey, it drops a little bit. Right? We also see a big increase in part compliance. Okay, so they're reporting higher levels of part compliance when you ask them in a survey context, and then um, and then for full compliance. Uh, some differences. So, in some ways, they don't look all that far off. We're getting fairly close, but we do see a huge jump in part compliance. So, when you ask them, they're kind of they seem to be hedging a little bit more. Um, you know, once you come right out and ask them. And so, this is the international samples. Uh, it gets much worse, I think, in the, in the U.S. sample. So, you see a bigger decrease in non-compliance goes down by um, uh, almost 10 percentage points here. Okay. Huge, huge increase in part compliance and a very large increase in compliance, suggesting, you know, these are all running in the direction you might expect, right? People are reporting that they would do bad things less, and they're reporting that they would do good things more. Right. Okay, let me just close then uh, with one of our favorite anecdotes that came out of this: uh, a response to the terrorism condition from a Florida-based corporate serv service provider. Okay, your stated purpose can well be a front for funding terrorism. I wouldn't even consider doing that for less than five thousand a month. Uh, this, uh, admittedly, was cherry picked out as one of our, you know, sort of favorite responses. But there are many, many, many more that are in this spirit, right? So when we throw up lots and lots of numbers, um, again, there's a bunch of anecdotes that underlie all these things, and and they're pretty troubling in, in a lot of different uh, situations. So pretty easy to acquire. Tax havens may be some of the best places. OECD may be some of the worst. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's the, the results in many ways, I think, are understandable and rigorous and systematic. There's some puzzles that are thrown in there as well. Um, but, uh, but anyway, but we look forward to uh, discussing it further. So, thanks. Well, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to these three political scientists. Uh, throughout my career, I've been accused of being a storyteller. Uh, all I do is tell these tales of wandering around the offshore world and finding these crooks, and that's not data. And in the political science world, if you've gone to any of the conventions of the American Political Science Association, if you tell about what you've experienced out there in the real world, you're considered a fool. Where is your PowerPoint with the data? Well, guys, you've done it. <laughs> Here's the data. Only it's even worse than you think, <laughs> right? And I'll go back to being anecdotal and push you in the direction of doing some more research. Uh, so here are some examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, Jersey is the most compliant of all the jurisdictions. You can walk into a Jersey provider and they'll want everything uh, short of fingerprinting you and uh, getting certified copies of every document you ever uh, had, birth certificates, passports, God knows what else. 
so you go to set up a corporation and they'll warn you that they're going to have to turn over a lot of information about that corporation pursuant to international requests. But gee, maybe you wouldn't want to do that. Maybe you'd like to set up this new thing they have called a foundation, which doesn't have these same requirements, which has a local board, which in turn can set up corporations, so we don't have to go through a lot of the rigmarole that, you know, the law here in Jersey requires us to go through. And these are the best guys in the business. So what they managed to do is sort of raise the cost of uh, doing this kind of thing in a way that makes them look super compliant. Uh, that's one of the, the kinds of problems. That is, the jurisdictions have figured out, gee, we have these restrictions on us. How do we make ourselves look better but not really deliver anything? And they're getting good at it. Now, uh, a second thing to, to talk about is what is going on with these offshore corporations? Well, the essential function of this entire offshore industry, not just corporations, it's trusts, it's all of the, the devices, insurance policy, wrappers, and, and all, all sorts of things that are used. It's to thwart regulation of any kind, to launder money, to escape any liability for what the corporation has done. I'll just note for the record the Union Carbide had this chemical plant in Bhopal, India, which blew up and killed God knows how many Indians. I, I don't think we know how many in the many, many thousands. And uh, that lawsuit to recover money on behalf of the people who were injured is still pending in court in Michigan, which is stunning because we are now, what, 20-some years past the original Bhopal piece of litigation. It's also designed to defeat national legal systems. Uh, America has quite a group of banksters who've gotten away with it all. Uh, you look at the financial crisis and ask who was prosecuted, who wasn't, and you find out that prosecution was just too difficult for the Justice Department to bring in many cases because the paper trail was so grotesque and it led through so many offshore jurisdictions, nobody could get the evidence, nobody could put the pieces together, and uh, regulation simply collapses in the face of that kind of paper problem. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's the issue of IRS. If it hadn't been for informants who came forward with literally copies of the records that showed offshore structures and how they were working. And I give you here the case involving uh, a client of mine who walked out with the records of LGT Bank and Liechtenstein. Those records included the structure, the, the trust, uh, the Anstalt, the corporations. It was all laid out as to how that was going to be used to defeat uh, taxation or supervision in any of the underlying jurisdictions. So this is a massive problem. Now, there's a terrible fact. For this all to work, it takes two to tango. So here the culprit is the United States Treasury, and they ought to hang their heads in shame because they steadfastly refuse to not recognize corporations that are a shell and exist in name only. So, for example, there are some 25,000 corporations, I think more by now, operating out of the island of Nevis. There are about 7,000 people on Nevis. 3,000 work for the hotel before seasons Nevis. Uh, the number of people who are on the boards of directors of these corporations, well, there are about 30 people who cover the 25,000 corporations. In 2008, I testified at Senate Finance. I said you could get these directors and waterboard them and still not find out what the corporation did, who owned it, and what it was about. And if you go to Nevis and try to find any record other than a group of signatures and maybe some passport pictures. And, and for the Nevis corporations, they have wonderful passport pictures of all of the directors. 
which were sent to the U.S. institutions and opened accounts for these people. So let me come back to the Treasury Department and its role in perpetrating this nonsense. Uh, first, no requirement of filing for American corporations, mind you, much less foreign corporations who are opening accounts here, any kind of taxpayer identification number. You come in, you do business, you don't have to have any way of being identified. But the second and, and probably most troubling aspect of, of this uh, uh, offshore uh, business is there's no substance to the corporate entity and there are forms and requirements like the IRS W8BEN that require the identification of the beneficial owner. Now if you go to the regs for IRS on the subject of the W8BEN it says, oh, the corporation is the beneficial owner of the corporation. Now you talk about mumbo-jumbo, nobody better at it than the reg writers at Treasury. Why wasn't that changed? They've known about it, it's been talked about, it's a hell of a problem, but they absolutely refuse to change it. And all it requires is a change in the regs. If you read the instructions for the regs, it says you have to identify the beneficial owner. They just don't enforce it. They have the regs set up so that a shell corporation is the owner. So what I'm saying is it takes two to tango. It takes a willing Department of Treasury to accept sham to make all of this worthwhile. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother with it. Okay? And the question is, why? Are they so adamant about protecting this shell game? Now, I put a bit of thought into it, and what strikes me is that they prefer to have a shell game that allows corporations, and we're now talking about the major multinationals, to set up a tax structure that is absolutely opaque, because there is no way for an IRS audit team to figure out what a multinational corporation is doing if it has enough corporate shells. So if you go to the 10Ks, and by the way, the SEC has managed to become somewhat complicit in this by not requiring public companies to list all of their subsidiaries. All they have to do is say they're non-material. And the accounting world takes all of these subs and, and consolidates their books so that when IRS does the audit, what it sees is not the underlying activity of the shell company, it only sees the consolidated books of the major company. So it turns all auditing of international, multinational corporations into a waste of time. The best IRS can do is look around to see whether deductions have been taken in the proper year, Reserves have been played with one way or another. The banks are very good at that. But really, looking at the underlying offshore games off the, off the table, not to be looked at, not to be questioned. So I ask, who is the Department of Treasury working for? Ain't working for me. And I think that's the next line of research and the next set of questions. But to come back to the work you guys have done, uh, it puts a floor under all the nonsense that is said about enforcement and, boy, we've got these tough rules. And I've just come back from Miami where a clown from the British Virgin Islands was talking about how wonderfully tough BVI has become on its corporate service providers, how well it regulates them. And uh, he's going on and on about the rules, and the, one of the panelists asked him, I asked him, uh, can you explain the regulatory steps you, you've taken based on the exposure of one of your trust companies in the ICIJ material? And the guy's like stunned. <laughs> Why did you bring that up? If you don't know what I'm talking about, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists got the internal files of one of these BVI trust companies.
and they put this is all up on the web, it's a searchable database. EVI didn't do anything, even though many of the disclosures showed that the trust companies were being used by crooks and thugs. So what is this about the regulation? The answer is whenever these international organizations promulgate a new set of rules, EVI immediately adopts them. We're compliant, look at us. The fact is there's no enforcement. So uh, how do you get away with standing up and saying what you say? What the guy from the BVI didn't say was their response to the ICIJ disclosure was to change the penalty for violating financial secrecy in BVI from a year in jail to 20 years in jail. Huh? <laughs> you know, this is transparency. This is opening the books. Uh, so here's, here's the question I want you to take away and ask every time this comes up. Why does the world want to respect a corporation that is not required to keep books, that has nominee officers, directors, and shareholders, that has no corporate records in the place of incorporation, and that maybe or maybe not knows who incorporated the corporation. Now why should anybody pay attention to that? And why are we, and why is the Treasury Department protecting it? Thanks. Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers and uh, for that final question that you can, uh, you can all cogitate on, shall we say. Um, I'd love to open the floor to some questions. We have a microphone which we can send around. Can I actually ask Josh to help us with that? Thank you. Um, so, questions today. All right, we've got two here. <laughs> Should I wait for the mic or just go for it? Yeah, if you could wait for the mic, that would be great. There we go. Uh, where was the question? Over here. Uh, thanks. My name is Aaron. I'm with HSBC Bank. Um, this is fantastic work. I'm really glad you guys did this. Um, one of the questions I have is about your treatment of the no response. Um, my thinking is that in some ways, for a sensitivity analysis, if you include those as compliant, how drastically does that change? If they looked at your you know, your, your request and basically said, we don't even want to deal with these guys. You know, obviously you can throw it out, there's no certainty, but just from a sensitivity aspect, have you included it sort of making different assumptions about how you interpret what a no response means, or were those just excluded entirely from, from kind of the calculations? So I'll let Mike jump in here too, but, but um, we were very worried about what no response meant. Uh, we, 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 we weren't certain. Uh, and so, um, you know, we approach these, uh, these CSPs many times um, with, you know, either the initial, the initial request or with multiple follow-ups. We haven't heard from you, you know, uh, you know please, please let us know. Um, and, and we did that in two different rounds for all of the corporate service providers in the study and three for some. Uh, if at the very end of that we didn't get any responses whatsoever, we went back to them with one of the North Australia aliases, and basically we said, are you still in business and helping customers? Right? Uh, and it turns out that the vast majority of, uh, of the CSPs didn't even answer that, the most innocuous approach we could, we, we could design. So we, we, uh, we think that the no responses are just that. They're not trying to be compliant. They're, you know, they, they are just, not, they, they either don't do international business, or they're not answering their email. Uh, and uh, so uh, now there is some sensitivity to no response. You can see that some of that, that non-response is what we would call soft compliance. They're not responding because they don't want to do business with us. And you can see that in the differences between the treatment effects, right? Between placebo and any of the treatments. So you, I mean, we do know that some of that is happening, but, but it turns out that the vast majority of the non-response is just not. I think I saw this. Hi, my name is Margo. I'm from ICIJ. And I have a question about the uh, methodology 
uh, about um, the service providers. Did you ask them to set up the companies in their own country? Because in looking at the data that we have, we see that a lot of requests for, for company setups are from other service providers in maybe some of the OECD countries to the BDI uh, service provider. Sure, so we left this open uh, in, in what we asked them. Like we didn't, we didn't specifically say we want to do it in your country. And in some cases they would, they would raise uh, recommendations or possibilities, right? So you know, they might say something like, well, you, you, know, you have your option of these three, or I think these three will fit, suit your needs really quite well, right? In which case we would just respond and kind of you know, uh, randomly, right, just sort of choose one. Um, but generally we didn't have like a specific sort of question about you know, like whether we would go in that particular locale. I actually uh, did a little bit of investigation of my own walking around talking to uh, service providers in one of the Channel Island jurisdictions. And uh, when I raised the question of setting up a shell company in the Channel Island, they oh no, you don't want to do that because our regulation of corporations here is too tight. Wouldn't you rather have us set up through our BVI office, a BVI entity? So the answer is that goes on all the time. Another question. Hi, I'm Stephanie Ostfeld with Global Witness. Thanks to the authors for being here and for your presentations and Jack to your presentation. I just want to reiterate something that Jack said, that this data, this evidence is so important to what so many of us here do, that we'll do investigations and put out case studies to try to illustrate you know, how, how this stuff works or how the OBings could use a California anonymous company set up by their lawyer to buy a $30 million mansion. But what you have is the data that shows that it's a systemic problem and it's not a one-off case that we were you know, lucky to find. So this data is so incredibly important to what we do. So my question is about the book, that one of your recommendations is about regulating corporate service providers um, and requiring them to collect beneficial ownership information. And you recommend that rather than having you know, the government entities that create these companies in the first place collect that information. So if I want to set up a company here, I don't need to use a corporate service provider. I can go to the internet. I can, I can do it myself. I can just fill it out and put whatever I want there. Like, isn't that a massive loophole to trying to figure out who's actually behind these companies? Um, wouldn't the best way to address this problem be requiring the government entities that create these companies in the first place to collect that beneficial ownership information? And if, that they're, if they're using corporate service providers and you're in a jurisdiction which regulates corporate service providers, which the United States is not one of those at the moment, um, they could be collecting and providing that information to the government entity, but that shouldn't the onus fall on the government entity that allows companies to be formed in the first place to collect information on the ultimate owners? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and uh, so, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're not policymakers. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're the messengers, right? We're, we're academics who do this study. Uh, it seems to us. I mean, one one of the one of the objections to heavy regulation is that uh, that the states in the United States anyway are the ones that actually manage all the regulation of of, of incorporation and, and corporate ownership. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the Association of Secretaries of State have made it really clear that 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 these some of these are pretty small states, right? With you know, with limited budgets, that they just don't have the capacity to to do that to do that regulation. Um, you know that may or may not be the case, uh, but but uh, but you know we took that at face value, roughly, right, and said, um, yes. For, I mean, some of these small countries, this is a hard thing to do, right? I mean, it's a, it requires a lot of management, and and so our, our thought was, if it were the responsibility of those who benefited and profited from it, uh, and if they were just audited, you know, randomly and periodically, you'd probably get the same effect, uh, but put the onus on those who who most benefit from the industry. Uh, and but yet still get you know still get the, the beneficial owner information. 
where, where, I mean, you know, that's 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 in the policy realm of uh, you know of you that know much more about this than and you know than we do. But that was our recommendation because of the because of the of the costs that would fall you know disproportionately on on taxpayers. I would say that at the moment IRS is buried in data about offshore service providers who are in the industry of helping tax evaders. Uh, that all came about because of voluntary disclosure and the massive amount of data collected by the IRS criminal division. I have yet to see any of that data used to prosecute a corporate service provider for assisting in a tax evasion case. Thank you, Treasury Department. Why are we protecting these people? And uh, the protection is just uh, inexplicable. It is against our national interest. It's against our international interest. It's against international regulation. And the more you think about it, the angrier you get. Over here. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Alena Shostko. I'm from Ukraine. I'm uh, visiting um, uh, Fulbright Scholar here, and I have several questions in this connection. It's a very actual problem for Ukraine, you see. And uh, my first question is, um, uh, what is the perspective of adoption of Levin bills in the USA? What is your evaluation? And uh, second question is connected with uh, new European uh, false money laundering uh, directive and new legislation of United Kingdom about open registered uh, open registered uh, of um, beneficial owners. Is it uh, work? What is how you may evaluate it? And uh, what um, obstacles you see in tracing, freezing, and recovery of assets in the COVID that may be placed in U.S. financial system? Well, and thank you very much for this good presentation. Thank you. I'll, I'll give it a, a shot for openers. Uh, the answer is that uh, it's, first of all, on asset recovery, it plain doesn't work. Uh, if you look at the total amount stolen from different countries, uh, Ukraine, phenomenal amount. I mean, there's been corruption ever since the day Ukraine broke away from the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union disintegrated. Uh, and those assets wound up in the West. I was an expert witness in the Lazarenko case. And in that case, uh, assets moved into a major uh, Dutch bank, they moved through U.S. banks, Lazarenko was convicted. I mean, this stuff is uh, uh, prevalent, but nobody gets the money back. And that's even true in American fraud cases, uh, where a classmate of mine in law school wound up as the president of a Miami bank called SunTrust, and he was caught out having uh, looted the bank to the tune of about 800, 900 million, close to a billion dollars. And uh, he wound up putting a bunch of that money offshore in trusts that were run in a way that the U.S. government, even though he was convicted, couldn't figure out how to crack. So he's now out of jail, figuring that he was paid about six, seven million dollars a year for serving time, which is kind of a dumb proposition. Uh, now, the recovery failure is because the trail leads through so many places. So a friend of mine does asset recovery. He's a very good lawyer on the island of Jersey. And he just recovered, I'd say, about $20 million for the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil because a governor of Sao Paulo state had ripped the state off unmercifully. And that case took 10 years to bring to fruition at a cost of several millions of dollars in litigation, and it required a political entity that was willing to pursue the case to the end. Uh, I worked on the Abacha asset recovery case, 
Uh, Abatra stole somewhere in the area of nine billion, seven billion, something like that, but well up there. And maybe a billion was returned. Uh, one of the grand ironies of the Abacha case, which I have to describe for you, was how a bunch of his money was frozen by those wonderful people in Liechtenstein. Uh, and the Liechtensteiners said, well, we can't give it back to the Nigerians because there was no criminal conviction in Nigeria of Abacha. Well, if you know anything about the American or English legal system, when a guy dies, that's the end of the criminal case. Abacha died. So this money is sort of frozen in perpetuity, and each one of the shell companies has a Liechtenstein lawyer representing it, and a Liechtenstein banker taking management fees for managing the money. And this is all going to roll on in perpetuity, and as far as I'm concerned, it's an annuity for the lawyers and the bankers in Liechtenstein. Uh, and nobody seems to be terribly embarrassed. <laughs> okay. So uh, th these are real problems. And uh, what Ukraine can do about it is a very difficult problem because that money is all in the West. And the will to do anything about it is minimal because I think the people managing it uh, are doing too well off the managing of it. And what's worse is they realize that if that money goes back, all this other illicit money that's been stolen from different places is at peril. And maybe they'll take it out of their banks and move it somewhere else. So th these are very good questions. And they're questions we have to look at very starkly. Because I'll be damned if the United States should be going to war or threatening or using very heavy political stuff to solve a problem that comes out of not having done anything about corruption or not having done anything to effectively retrieve the money that has been stolen from a country that has in turn precipitated a crisis. Uh, before talking about a little about the legislation um, that you're referring to, I will say that you know we have spoken to treasury officials who I, I'm sure you know that there's this task force that's been created now, um, and you know we've been told actually just just so you know that um, the Ukrainian officials, the sort of bureaucrats that uh, that were left in place, um, that they've now been working with are actually among the, the best people that they've ever worked with on trying to to trace money and, and figure out where it went to bring it back. So, you know, asset recovery has a lot of challenges, a lot of massive challenges to it, um, which is why we focus on the prevention end. Um, but I will say that the U.S. government feels, you know, it is happy with, with the people that they are working with, so that you should take a little comfort, slight bit of comfort in that. Um, with respect to the legislation that you're referring to, uh, I will go through those, those bits and pieces. So in the U.S., we have two bills um, pending before Congre Congress, uh, one in the House and one in the Senate. The Senate bill is S-1465, and the House bill is H.R. 1333. Um, both of these bills, uh, they're called the Corporation Transparency and Law Enforcement Assistance Act, and both of these bills are, in fact, bipartisan in both houses. Uh, they are not moving because of opposition of Secretaries of State in primary focus. The American Bar Association is also opposed to the bills. Um, essentially, they would require states to collect beneficial ownership information on corporations when they're incorporated. Um, the House bill is a little bit different in that it says Treasury would have to collect that information unless the states are already doing so. Um, in all other respects, they're pretty much the same. Both of those bills would also regulate corporate service providers. That is also a provision of the, of the bill, and that is why the American Bar Association imposes them, because they don't want lawyers to have to be um, brought into that system. So those are the basics on that bill. Um, this is the fourth Congress that these bills have been introduced, and they've changed a lot in the different congressional sessions as they've been reintroduced. Um, uh, we have learned a lot, uh, the, the congressional champions have learned a lot about, about the issue and where perhaps appropriate exceptions should be made for different types of companies. For example, a public company, a, a stockholder company, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to have to collect beneficial ownership on that kind of company, so they would be accepted, those kind of things. Um, we are losing our main champion on this in the Senate, however. Senator Levin is actually retiring this year, and we're not, look, we're not seeing a lot of progress being made um, in, this, in this congressional session on moving these forward. Uh, we would really love to see a hearing in the Judiciary Committee where that Senate bill now sits, um, and, uh, and would love any, any support you can give us on, on moving that forward so we can at least get a hearing and, and some testimony on the record on this issue. So that, those are the, the U.S. bills. Moving on to the EU Anti-Money Laundering Directive. Um, for those of you who don't know, the third EU Anti-Money Laundering Directive is, is being revised to create a fourth European Union Anti-Money Laundering Directive. And as part of that, um, the European Parliament has approved uh, some amendments to that directive which would require each of the nations and the member states to actually collect beneficial ownership in a public registry. And not only of corporations, but also of trusts. So that information, beneficial ownership information, would have to be collected by the governments, um, put in a registry, and published for both corporations and trusts. That legislation is currently with what we call the, the trilogue. Um, it's going through uh, further deliberation by the, the <laughs> council and the commission. And um, it's sort of more of a closed door type of a process. So it's difficult to know what's going to come out of that. They can change that text. I think it's likely that they will. Um, the question is how much? And we're not sure what that balance is. It comes down to what each of the individual European Union countries really feel um, as you know what they think is the way forward and what they're willing to to do and change in their systems. Um, and you know we know we have some countries on board, and we know we have others that are not. So it's a bit of a black box at the moment with respect to the EU. I don't know. There are other people in the audience who could probably um, elaborate on that if they'd like to, and I welcome you to raise your hands if you'd like to. Um, and I will also move on to, you were asking about the UK. And so the U United Kingdom is, is the first country to really take a, a strong public stance on this issue. They have committed to creating public registries of beneficial ownership information for companies. Not necessarily for trusts. They're looking at the trust issue now. Um, I think it's more likely that they're going to end up doing private registries of trust that's available to law enforcement. Um, and that's in line with some, some uh, information ex international information exchange treaty approaches that are going on now as well. Um, so, you know, the UK is absolutely committed and they're currently going through the process of trying to implement that. So, you know, we will see. We will see where that goes. But, uh, but it's certainly looking strong for the collection of beneficial ownership information and availability of it to the public in the UK. Thank you. I saw a hand up over here. Okay. Just, um, <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, this is to any of the panelists. Could you give an overall perspective? We're talking about the, the primarily the shell games here, but we've also seen companies like Apple uh, uh, arranging for all of its profits to be taken in Ireland because of uh, uh, favorable treatment there. Uh, how would you characterize the overall universe of, of this kinds of corruption and tax avoidance in terms of proportions and so forth? As far as I'm concerned, this is the global economic issue, uh, particularly with respect to the uh, lack of revenue that gov governments face to meet the challenges of their own populations. Uh, the way, the architecture of the international tax system uh, allows multinational corporations to play with as many of these corporate shells as they'd like in as many jurisdictions as they'd like in ways that make figuring out what their tax bill is virtually impossible or in ways that arbitrage the differences in the laws of different jurisdictions so there's no tax at all. So in the case of Apple, Senator Levin properly commented they have reached the holy grail of corporate taxation, which was figuring out a way to put the money in nowhere so that no jurisdiction had the ability to collect tax. And that is the genius of this tax planning. The problem is that the architecture also is set up in a way that makes it impossible for any national tax authority to properly audit what's going on worldwide in any of these corporations. 
And if you want a screaming example of the failure of anybody to be able to get control of the situation, last week the Wiley brothers, I don't know if you saw anything about this in the papers, but the Wiley brothers were convicted of SEC fraud in a New York court. Now the Wiley brothers owned a series of public companies, uh, one of which was Michael Storrs. I don't know if you know what Michael Storrs is, but anyway, they own Michael Storrs uh, as principal shareholders, uh, and uh, they had gone through a tech company and some other companies, and they brilliantly decided they personally weren't going to pay tax on anything. So they had a series of trusts set up, and literally everything in their lives was owned by an offshore trust, uh, including wristwatches, clothing, paintings hanging on the walls of their houses, which also were owned by offshore trusts. And uh, the, uh, they decided that the stock options and the other stuff they got from their involvement with these corporations would also be placed in offshore arrangements, uh, which completely concealed the fact that they were majority shareholders of some of the corporations they were involved in. So there was securities fraud as well. So these guys committed tax fraud, securities fraud. They were never prosecuted. IRS thought the case was too complicated, couldn't touch it, didn't touch it. SEC finally shamed into doing it. And we are now, this is uh, 2014, this stuff was disclosed in 2004 in suspicious activity reports filed by Fidelity Investments and only looked at, and the reason it came to a case was because Morgenthau, who was the New York County District Attorney, came upon these reports and began to push the SEC and said, what the hell are you doing about this? And it took from 2004 to 2014 to do anything because of the sheer complexity in the investigation and the stuff the lawyers did the discovery in this case is unbelievable. The point being that you can have a lot of law and regulation, but if there's nobody around to enforce it, and there aren't people who know how to follow the trail, and you can't shortcut it, it takes forever. So the ultimate question is, why the hell do you permit it? Why could the Wileys open uh, 20 different accounts at Fidelity in various offshore corporate names without identifying the fact they were all owned by the same guy and then run this scam for the better part of 20 years and have nobody figure out what was going on. And that's because there was no requirement made that the W8BEM that would show that these corporations were owned by the same individual uh, there was no requirement that they actually disclose their ownership because the Treasury Department says the beneficial owner of the corporation is the corporation. This violated corporate law, tax law, everything else. And if they had disclosed beneficial ownership, the anti-money laundering laws and the suspicious activity reporting requirements would have opened this Pandora's box years before. A, a quick comment and follow up with a question. Um, one of the terms that gets kicked around, especially in the, the private sector, uh, they talk about due diligence. And, uh, you know, private sector gets kind of hammered about doing customer due diligence. And it kind of seems to me that uh, regardless of whatever legislation or existing reg uh, regis excuse me, uh, regulations, it seems as though in, we are we're all we're pretty much back at the issue of enforcement. And so, um, just just kind of a comment, I, you know, I think there's an expectation that even, even the government does due diligence um, so that, you know, we pay into the tax funds, there's an expectation that they, they execute or enforce the rule of law. But if I could uh, just uh, switch gears here, uh, just doing research about shadow banking institutions, and uh, if you 
provide a comment. Uh, according to a 2013 uh, shadow banking monitoring report, 2012 about five trillion dollars of new investment uh, was entered into the uh, shadow banking system and uh, they estimate according to uh, the Financial Stability Board uh, estimate about 75 trillion dollars worldwide is in uh, shadow banking institutions. Uh, if for people that don't know shadow banking uh, system uh, is a uh, credit intermediary but uh, they pretty much package financial assets and they buy they uh, they buy and sell these financial assets to other institutions um, just a recommend it or do you have uh, uh, and according to the um, I think the IMF uh, published a paper within the last uh, year or so talking about how shadow banking institutions aren't going anywhere anytime soon uh, is there any recommendations on what we can do or what uh, what the government can do what the private sector could do in order to uh, reduce uh, the kind of the vulnerability that this this new type of uh, non-banking institution uh, provides sure the answer is pretty simple which is close them down and move it back on shore but instead, the mentality has become offshore is the norm. So the United States, through the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, sets up and says you're now required to trade derivative securities through an exchange. Uh, the banks go to set up the exchange. Where is the exchange incorporated? In the Cayman Islands. Why is the exchange incorporated in the Cayman Islands? Because the banks want to use offshore money to capitalize the exchange and not pay tax on the offshore money. Federal Reserve says, great, we're for that. Uh, the New York State Banking Commission says, great, we're for that. I'm a taxpayer. I say, you guys out of your goddamn minds? Uh, that's the problem. The, the mentality is that this offshore world, whether it's for finance subsidiaries of major corporations who can then uh, not be subject to any bank reserve requirements, which is really the underlying problem. Uh, all of this can be closed down by saying you got to do it onshore, where reserve requirements apply, where regulation applies. All of the offshore stuff allows the escape from these, these things. But the, the banter in the business world is that's all legitimate. That's the good offshore. I'm sorry, it's not. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you again to all the panelists for uh, their great work um, and their insights into this uh, pernicious problem. Um, my name is Mark Hayes. I'm also with Global Witness. And I had a question for Michael and Daniel about research. Um, in our organization, we're continuing to do research to uncover case studies where anonymous companies have been used to facilitate this sort of crime. And uh, that research is probably a little bit different from yours in some ways, but I'm curious in that vein. Um, What's next for you all in terms of exploring this or related issues further? And how has your experience with this body of research perhaps informed those next steps in terms of how you've approached it or where you might go? I mean, that's a great question, Will. I mean, we're, we're still um, trying to decide what the next move is. Um, sometimes when we, I, I've presented, you know, Jason and I and, and Mike came to this with Bear. In, in various uh, audiences of practitioners, right? So it's you know, sort of industry kind, kinds of conferences and meetings. They're very interested. Uh, but some have said, you know, um, you've told us about incorporation. We believe your story. We just think that banking is much more important. Uh, and that's, and, the, and, the, and that everything stops at banking. And, and, the, and there the regulations are well, you know, are well followed. And, and my answer is we don't know because that study hasn't been done. We suspect that there are big issues and problems there. Sometimes when we, when we raise this with, with practitioners, you know, it takes a few minutes for them to stop laughing, right? You know, uh, the, 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 the question, you know, about the question of banks. Um, so we're we're contemplating doing a banking study. Um, I'm not sure we will, but but uh, but uh, you know, because there's lots involved there, and you know, we're we're very worried about the ethics, you know, of, of our research, and um, and banks are required to you know to, to file reports on any suspicious activity. So if we did so, so we have to do it with the full knowledge and disclosure of the, you know, the, the IRS and, you know, and other banking regulation bodies. But but we think it, you know, there's probably value in, in that in an independent academic study on this on this on this issue. 
Uh, and so we're, we're thinking about doing that. I don't know if we'll Yeah, I just have a question for, for you guys, the authors. Um, Jack touched on it a little bit, but if you could sort of share your insights about why you, you got the results that you did. Do you have any hypothesis about why the OECD countries had, had so much lower compliance? I, I haven't read the book, so if you talk about it a lot in there, but I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. Um, so, you know, one of the, the nice things about experiments is you can try to uncover these causal effects. Uh, what, what they often don't do is tell you, like, the mechanisms that are driving, like, what's there, right? And so, you know, we've heard lots of, uh, you know, people sort of throw out alternative explanations, right? And, and I'm not sure we can say confidently, like, what's sort of what's driving what. And so we've heard things like, the, you know, tax havens or, you know, providers and tax havens are just much better at figuring things out, too, right? So not, not from the perspective of what you said of sort of, like, moving into different avenues, which is also really interesting, but just sort of like picking up on like, you know, what's, you know, what's going on and, and, and reading between the lines and stuff like that and figuring out like, what do you need to say and when and so forth. And so that's some, you know, plausible alternative. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, there's so much that's happening at the domestic level, right? in in some OECD countries, and probably a lot of our results are driven by the United States, right? Where, you know, in our country by country or sort of the overall country grouping analysis, right? We have lots and lots of countries in there, but you have you know a really big offender, um, and you know being the U.S., where so much happens because it's a, a federal system. So much happens at the state level as opposed to the national level, right? And so you know, so it's possible that you know, just given certain certain say federal structures and so forth, um, in highly influential countries, right, that we're seeing you know some of that drive uh, you know OECD down and perhaps tax havens up and so forth and so. You know, I mean, ultimately, you know, this is maybe somewhere where we need to go next is, is starting to, to, to pick apart what's actually going on, you know, at these different levels. I, I would just add, I would just add that, um, I mean, if you look at sort of the diplomatic history of this, uh, the U.S., U.K., and other OECD countries were very um, vigorous in creating the, the Financial Action Task Force uh, and, um, and, in, and, and put lots of pressure on... Uh, on especially tax havens to comply with these rules that the, the FATF has put, has put forward. Um, what's not clear is that those rules are biting at all on the on the founders and originators of those you know of, of these of these international standards. So you know uh, I mean it's, it's complicated, right? I, I don't think that, that the U.S. government is really you know really wants this system, but given the Constitution and that you know you know uh, businesses are regulated by states, it's really hard to to, to move around it. Uh, UK has a lot, a lot easier, you know, time in, in, in making a switch here because of its, you know, Parliament is sovereign there. It's just not the case with the U.S. Constitution. So, uh, but it does it does smack many as hypocritical, right? So, the U.S. and UK and others have put the pressure on, um, and and to, and and at least there's really good evidence that the tax havens are complying, at least with this one important piece, which is you know disclosure of beneficial owners, uh, but but they haven't followed suit. For those of you who are old enough to remember this, there was a push for a while for a federal incorporation law that would move this stuff out of the hands of state governments uh, and make anybody that was doing business across state lines do a federal incorporation. And that would then give federal regulatory authority the ability to uh, set the rules for the, those corporations. I think that that's a debate that really ought to be ginned up again. The problem in the state of Delaware is, uh, my good neighbors, I live in Maryland, don't pay sales tax, don't pay income tax, and they're living on the float that comes from this sea of criminality. And I'm sick of it, you know. They ought to pay sales tax, they ought to pay income tax like the rest of us at the state level. Uh, we've got to start figuring out how to stop making this a profit center <clears throat> for state governments. And Nevada is really a, a sick example because these people went into the business at first to cheat California. Their idea was, we'll set up our corporations, we won't cooperate with anybody on information about our corporations, so if we can get California businesses to set up in Nevada, 
nobody, nobody will be able to audit them. And uh, by the way, Nevada won't cooperate with the federal IRS. Uh, the way our system works is state tax authorities sign agreements uh, with the federal tax authorities. So Nevada is a real outlier. And if you want to uh, play for uh, uh, a system that doesn't work at all, you couldn't have designed anything better than Nevada came up with. A state shouldn't be able to do that. But I'll point out that when I testified on this whole question uh, before the uh, committee that was then the Committee of Jurisdiction, Homeland Security, whatever, the uh, chief player in it was a senator from Delaware who railed at me for probably 20 minutes before I could open my mouth because Tax Justice Network had published a report pointing to Delaware as the major culprit. He was not happy. <laughs> and he sure as hell wasn't going to let any legislation to correct the problem get out of his committee. I'm just going to jump back in real quick on Dan's comment about the hypocrisy too. I mean, you know, one thing that Dan and I see sort of as international relations scholars more generally is is this playing out in, you know, domain after domain, right? And so, um, you know, the, the powerful countries in the world can, can sort of set the rules that they want everyone else to live by and, and, and that they don't necessarily have to, have to respect, right? And so, you know, the, the U.S. and other countries love having international courts, right? Uh, when it means you can, you can go after people you really don't like. Uh, the powerful countries don't like the courts, right? When it means that their own people might be able to go through, have to go through those courts. Right, the, you know, the powerful countries want to be able to conduct covert operations and so forth. Uh, when it's beneficial for them, they don't, you know, want that ability for other countries and so forth. So, so in many ways, this, you know, certainly fits into a larger pattern that we see in international relations, which is OECD countries are powerful, right, and 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 they can try to call the shots in in, in various ways, and unfortunately, it, it leads to uh, some what feels like pretty blatant hypocrisy. Yeah. So, thanks. Um, but one of the things you were testing for, right, is non-compliance. So you were asking these companies to do something that they should not be doing under the law. So in that sense, it strikes me not as though, you know, we've set up a system that allows this to happen. In the broader sense, yes, with the beneficial ownership, but for what you were testing specifically, these guys were violating regulations and laws. They're required to do this. So it strikes me as an enforcement issue that we're just not enforcing these things if these companies were really concerned that hey you might be the IRS on an undercover operation and they were going to get busted hard if they responded in the ways that they did here in the United States they wouldn't be doing that so it strikes me kind of as an, as an enforcement issue uh, the other thing I want to throw out there is just do you think the new FATF uh, uh, approach to to rating countries now that it's going to look more at actual effectiveness rather than just laws on the books is likely to have any impact on this at all or, or not really Sorry, is the question whether the new FAT has an impact on research or research no, no, on that? Whether going forward you think that, that the new approach FAT is taking to rating countries and their compliance, not just with laws on the books, but actual effectiveness, will likely have an impact on this, this issue overall or not? Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, Jason has talked to the, the, you know, some folks there, and they're not interested in doing this kind of auditing, right? the kind of thing we did. Um, and I think unless you're doing, you know, uh, careful audits, you're going to have a hard time, you know, tracking and enforcing. So, um, you know, and that's and that's why the Caymans, uh, you know, have been so successful in shutting, in, or at least making sure that all beneficial owners are tracked, is because they they audit, you know, pretty aggressively. And so so does Jersey Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, right? So, I mean, they're you know they do that. And I think unless unless FATF is doing that as well, or or you know or somehow you know, being involved with that, it's going to be hard to know who's compliant and who's not. You just can't read this from the, from the laws and the books and, and, and know what the compliance rates are. So as I understand the new rules, to, or what, what they're planning to do, a lot of this is based on, going to be based on convictions, right? Um, and you know, as, as social scientists, we, we know that this can become very problematic like very, very quickly, right? I mean, it's like crime statistics. When you see crime statistics go up, right? Sometimes that means that, you know, if they're based on things like convictions, right, sometimes it means that there's more crime, right, and you're really capturing more crime. And sometimes it just means that you're, in, you know, that you're doing a whole lot more. There's no change in crime, but you're just doing a lot more, right? And so when you start to get into something like convictions, you're, you have a huge selection problem, right? 
and that selection problem becomes very difficult to disentangle. So if it goes forward primarily on the basis of convictions, then you know we're potentially uh, just going to be continue. Uh, we're going to continue to mislead ourselves about you know what what the problems are, where they're located, and so forth. I think on the enforcement front, there are a few things that have to be said. Uh, first of all, uh, the Swiss banks are probably the most outstanding example of the failure of enforcement. Because in bank after bank case, when IRS had all the goods, there's no way to criminally prosecute the bank or its top officers. Instead, a small selection of lower ranking people uh, were sent to the guillotine. And even they, if they don't come to New York to go shopping, won't go to the guillotine. They'll just be imprisoned in Switzerland. Uh, and maybe some of the people who have turned over the information will be prosecuted. But the other problem is a basic problem of criminology, which is the purpose of all criminal law is deterrence. And you don't get deterrence unless somebody actually is afraid of the outcome of the enforcement action. And these damn banks, you know, who pays the penalty? The shareholders. And what kind of penalty is it? One quarter earnings? Does that really matter? Does anybody care? And the executives, God help us, double their bonuses in the year that the bank's been hit with a multi-billion dollar penalty. So where's the deterrent effect of the enforcement action? And the answer is, hey, it's a parking ticket. And God knows how many people I know have piles of them in the back seat of their car. And the only time they'll ever pay them up is if the car's booted. Now, somewhere, one of these banks has to lose its license, and these people have to be put in jail. And at that point, we may have enforcement that works. But as long as it's this business of, uh, we're going to send you a letter saying you were a bad boy, which is what happens when somebody violates uh, uh, the know your customer rules, or there's an audit of an institution to see how well its compliance department is working, or there's something more than a passing fine, we're in a fool's game. And uh, the enforcement just isn't going to happen. OK, so I've got one more here, and then we'll go to Joe and Brent. And I think that may be all we have time for. Thank you for waiting. Yeah, thank you. Now, in connection to what you just said, and also, I mean, for me, the irony of choosing between shell companies and banking. No? I mean, I'm looking specifically now at the Caribbean and the situation more in connection with organized crime and human trafficking, but one of the things that I kind of find out is it's not clear who are the owners of all the investment companies and the thousands of banks that operate there. So, yeah. and I don't know what your experience with that. But, yeah. Well, you know, here's, here's another thing that's lost in this whole damn debate. Uh, the corporation was a pretty important invention, but the purpose of the corporation was to allow businessmen to go out and do some kind of business without risking anything more than the assets they put up in the corporation. So initially, to set up a corporation, you had to specify what business you were going to do, who you were, because you, the people behind it had to be known, because this was going to go on a public register, and whoever did business with them would be on notice of who they were doing business with. And uh, in the event of a failure, their liability would be limited to the capital that was put in the business. Now, that original model morphed into a situation where uh, no stated capital, or maybe a dollar stated capital, no known officers, directors, or shareholders, no known location for business books and records, uh, no ability to figure out anything about the entity, and its sole purpose is to provide anonymity. Now, that is a perversion of the per original purpose of the corporation. Uh, why is that recognized by any legitimate government that wants to have uh, enforcement of its laws? No, in, I mean, and you mentioned before the case of Davies, now as and kids, and you have another compound element there, which is like Dominica or St. Kitts, you, you pay $100,000, 
and you get a second citizenship. Yeah. Well, that, that's the other part of what yeah. they, they're full service. Yeah. <laughs> my, my managing director um, tells a story about he was at a bar, we, you know, we, we travel a lot in my organization, he's at a bar one night somewhere, God knows where, um, some capital of a European country, and it turns out the guy next to him at the bar is a, is a banker, and they get to chat. And, uh, and Tom says, so, so how do you decide how many layers of corporations you're going to put in any given structure? And the guy said, well, we figure, you know, we, we figure that it's, it's something like, you know, it'll cost them an extra $500,000 at least to investigate each layer. So we just ask the people, you know, we, we look at, at what, what the enforcement is and, uh, and sort of do a calculation based on, based on that, you know, how much, how much is an enforcer going to put into actually an investigation from where this person is, is originating the company. It's just an interesting calculation, right? But I think they come from the point that money is not an issue. Right, money is not an issue. Yeah. Hi, Joe Krause with The One Campaign. Uh, first of all, thanks to the authors for this great research. Those of us who are on the front lines of policy change on this issue, like Jack said, this is really valuable for us uh, in terms of making concrete arguments, and people do love numbers, so this is really helpful. Um, so a couple of quick comments before I have a, have a question. Um, one is to this issue of enforcement. I think as Jack noted, you can have the best regulation, the best, best laws in the books, but if there's not active enforcement, then you have to question how strong the whole system is. And I actually was on the panel a couple weeks ago that Jack referenced in Miami on beneficial ownership, and I was on that panel with someone who um, is in the private sector from the Cayman Islands and someone who is from BVI, who's a BVI regulator. Uh, and you know, and those two gentlemen I talked with at, at length, both during and after the panel, and then a number of other people who are from the Caribbean islands. and. To a person, they all are adamant that they have the best, strongest regulations uh, in the world for company service providers. This maybe is one reason why there is a difference between the, the quote unquote tax havens in your study and others is um, the regulations are stronger um, and they're, they're watched more closely. But the, the, the flip side of that, as Jack alluded to earlier, is if there is an active enforcement of that, then you're going to still have a few bad apples who decide to do business, especially if you're offering them a premium. Um, and you know, as the ICIJ investigation, offshore leaks investigation highlighted, there's still the you know, there were a number of at least suspicious cases that came out of the offshore leaks that's still being investigated. Um, a lot of those were based in to be in BVIs and other similar jurisdictions. Uh, so they have the best regulated company service providers in the world, but there's still obviously issues, which gets to the enforcement issue. And as I'm sure the two authors can, can, can validate, it takes a whole army of people to pull off this relatively small study, right? Imagine doing this at a, you know, at a, all the way through every single country. And have, you'd need, law enforcement would need to have a small army in each country to do real rigorous um, uh, enforcement. So I think for, for us and a number of other groups in the room who work on this issue on the policy side, I think this is a really valid reason for why having this information being publicly available is so critical. And I think the ICIJ investigation really highlights that, that there is real value to having public involved in this, having journalists on the ground in specific countries who know the names of these people and what their connections may or may not be. So I think that's really important. A couple of really quick other points. Um, my organization works on uh, this issue in the EU. We have a number of offices, including in Brussels. I spent a couple of months there working on this myself last fall. Um, Heather did a great job of describing where things stand. The European Parliament's position is super strong. Um, it's now in the back door rooms being negotiated, unfortunately, and we don't have a lot of transparency in that process. Um, but just to note that there's an important meeting um, amongst the council and that the, later this month, the 20th of May, and then it's likely this issue won't be resolved until sometime in the fall, given the parliamentary elections, et cetera. Um, and then just one other note, the number of um, the quote unquote tax havens, the offseas, especially the overseas territories and crown dependencies of the UK um, have or are currently going through uh, public consultations on this issue of beneficial ownership, whether or not they should have centralized registries rather than just having the FATF requirements of having 
helping the service providers hold this information. Um, Jersey has done it, BVI, Cayman Islands have done it, Moms Rob's finished yesterday, um, Turks and Caicos' uh, consultation runs to the end of this month. So they've been under a, quite a bit of pressure by David Cameron, who's really been a leader, leader on this issue. And so it's, you know, the cynic in me wants to suspect that this was probably a rhetorical exercise, that they've been forced to the table to address this issue and that they're holding these consultations. In the case of Montserrat, it literally was a one-page kickback exercise, so it's not clear how seriously they're taking it. Um, but I think it demonstrates that there's momentum, um, there's more attention being focused on this issue. Um, so just a quick question um, for the authors. You mentioned, and, and maybe I'm, I haven't had a chance to read the book, I've read the paper that I think was the background for this book, um, that you looked at 181 countries and then you had the, the graph that showed where so the results, that you only listed the ones we had 15, was it responses or 15 approaches? 15 approaches. 15 approaches. I'm just curious some why. Of were, some of them were, were much lower than 15 responses. I'm just curious why you why you didn't re, didn't approach all of them at least a minimum number of times so that you could have something that was just statistically relevant. I mean, good question. Um, the I mean, the issue was that, that in some places we just had a hard time finding um, very many corporate service providers. So uh, in some of these small countries, in some, in some countries you'll notice if you look if you look online at our map. You know, on uh, globalshowgames.com, you'll see that uh, that Africa is mostly missing, and that's because we just couldn't find them there. So, and we didn't want we didn't want to do more than two uh, approaches because we worried we, we worried that they might detect that this was you know something other than you know the, the face value you know customer who we were pretending to be. So, that's a great question. And so, I mean, we we, we put the league table out there, you know, as um, as something we think is interesting for the policy debate. But you know that you know that you know that graph is you know, probably one of the things we put less social scientific weight on, right? We're, we're much more confident about discussing the experimental results than we are those we call those observ observational results. But they're interesting, they're valuable, they probably tell us something. So, and, and they were and we were systematic about it, but but not as comprehensive as as, as we would have liked to have been. I'd like to respond to the whole approach of regulating the service providers. EVI has now pushing on over a million corporations. Uh, look at the population of EVI, look at the number of companies in the service provider business. And now let's posit that they make the service providers get the information. And now on a million companies, we're waiting for mutual legal assistance requests from around the world as to beneficial ownership. And BVI has a guy who once a week opens the mail to look at those requests. How many months, years do you think it will be before even if BVI had the accurate information, it would actually get it to the cop who needed it? And by the way, if it weren't a cop, would they give it to somebody who's simply involved in something minor like recovering assets after a big fraud or some other kind of financial shenanigans where there are now victims of a fraud who are trying to recover or let's say hedge fund investors where the hedge fund disappeared, it's in liquidation, the assets have disappeared and who's behind what. Uh, and the answer is even if they had all the damn information, it would operate at such a glacial pace, inevitably, that it wouldn't much change the picture. And the question I come back to again and again is, why should any of those corporations be allowed to open a bank account anywhere else on the planet? Why should they be allowed to be subsidiaries of major U.S. corporations? Uh, why should they be allowed to have any roots in the financial system? There's no absolutely no legitimate reason for it. And secrecy, I would argue, is not legitimate. I just want to add sort of one comment back on the issue of kind of regulation versus enforcement. You know, what's interesting is we observe a lot of variation in the data. And so you could think of a lot of possible combination, well, at least three or four possible combinations of regulation and enforcement, right? One is that there's a set of countries out there where there's no regulation, no enforcement, right? And I'm dichotomizing, right? Which, you know, 
but no regulation, no enforcement, then there might be some where there's regulation and enforcement, right, both, and then there's probably some where there's, you know, uh, you know, one of each, perhaps, right? Perhaps not enforcement without regulation, but regulation without enforcement. I think what's interesting is we see when you go from, uh, say, countries with no regulation, no enforcement, to countries with regulation but no enforcement, we actually observe some change there, right? We observe some variation. And so the question being, like, uh, you know, is uh, if there's no enforcement at all, why are we observing some differences still in the results, I guess? And so, so I guess it's sort of a, a, a just kind of throw a caveat out there, I guess, that you know, regulation may do some things, right? And I think we observe some differences in the data. But, uh, but the point is well taken that enforcement just seems like, you know, just absolutely crucial here um, in, in order to, to really get where, where, where things need to go. Okay, so one last question over here. Uh, yes, this is a question for the authors. Um, are you in the midst of a book tour? Uh, yeah, what are your plans in that regard? And and have you uh, have you targeted any groups to try to make presentations or any localities such as Delaware? Are you going to universities? Or, no, I'm serious. Are, are you looking at religious congregations or small businesses? Just could you tell us what your thinking is there? Uh, this pretty much is the book tour. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is that you know academic work. It's just a different world, right? Uh, you know, this is. Uh, um, you know, the, typically academic, you know, projects like this tend to be pretty low profile, and uh, and you can tell because you know after ten years, only four people have ever cited the work, right? Uh, uh, we think this will probably get a few more than four, but but uh, but yeah, that's I mean you know I mean um, you know it's a different kind of exercise than we typically see in the popular press. So, uh, but but we I mean we're certainly open right to those possibilities. Yeah, I'd love to hear concrete suggestions whether you know. Should we call up Delaware and go there? I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, will, will, will we be able to get out again? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thank you all very much for coming. I would say, I would just add that, you know, for those of you who are looking for a more um, concrete uh, and, and very relevant time appropriate um, issue as well, uh, anonymous shell companies are a problem in campaign finance as well. And uh, U.S. PERG has done, Public Interest Research Group has done a fair amount of work on that aspect of this, and I find that very interesting. And then I'll leave you with one fundamental question, and that is, why shouldn't you be able to figure out who you're doing business with? Right? That's a very fundamental question, um, and one I, I will leave you with. So the authors and, and the panelists are, are generally available for, for chatting after, and we have some books on sale. Um, GFI is not getting any cut of this at all. It's face value. I just don't know what the face value is. Um, I, I, what so, are the, yeah. so the, the, the discounted price uh, for paperback is twenty six thirty nine. Okay. So there you go. Um, they are available for sale if you would like to buy a book. Um, and